This is Novel Marketing. I'm Thomas Umstadt, Jr. I'm James L. Rubart. And this is the show for novelists who want to become best-selling authors. In this episode, we're going to talk about the power of video. Video? In case you, I thought this a was a video. book about or a podcast about writing books. <laughs> no, it's a book about making videos. <laughs> <laughs> they tuned in. You tuned in the wrong podcast. No, uh, uh, no, this is the Novel Marketing Podcast. But we want to talk to you about how videos can help you engage with your readers more than you ever have. In case you haven't noticed, videos are now becoming more and more and more the standard in marketing. Um, companies that never did videos before are hiring videographers to come in and do videos and profiles and this kind of thing on their companies. USA Today did a big format change and all of a sudden half of their content is now video. That happened within the last, gosh, I want to three, uh, say three months, Thomas. And so the question is, how do we as authors get on this train and use it to engage readers more deeply? So why is video important? Why can't I just write a book and not have to mess with this? Yeah, I know. Why is all this marketing stuff so important? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, Thomas. The other night I was watching, I was just, I was waiting for Darcy and I, I went to YouTube and I used to be a running back in, when I played football. And so I love seeing, you know, these great NFL backs. And so I went to a number of these YouTube videos where people have compiled their idea of the 10 greatest running backs of all time, that sort of thing. And one of the videos came up and it was essentially pictures of the backs. <laughs> Without them actually running. Fail. There was stats on them, and it was if, yeah, incredible fail. It's like, okay, I was done with that after about you know 20 seconds because I want to see them in motion. I want to see the video. The power of video is not just seeing an author's picture, but actually seeing them in motion. They want to get to know us, and pictures can only go so far. That's right. And it's there's now when we talk about video, there's two completely different approaches to video. And I've seen authors use both of these. Uh, one is kind of the classic book trailer or putting together well produced video. And there there's an expectation of high production value. High, 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 very high. Yeah. Because they're comparing it to what they see on TV and what they see in the movies, which is where millions of dollars are being uh, made or spent. So oftentimes people are very critical of Christian films and it indicates kind of the ignorance of the mo typical movie watching audience because Christian films are independent films and but there, people aren't comparing them to other independent films in which case they compare quite nicely actually in terms of production values and acting and story etc no what they compare them to is you know Avengers which is a hundred million dollar budget <laughs> or you know <laughs> other major blockbusters the other films that they see and you'd be like oh that's unfair you're being hard on these indie films and it's like well that's their opinion, and their opinion is valid, and you're not going to be able to educate all of the people saying, hey, these production values are high. But there's another kind of video where you don't have to have high production values, where people almost expect a more homemade yes. feel. And that is live video, Facebook Live or Periscope, something like that. And then suddenly, people want to be invited into your house. They want a kind of a, a rougher uh, video quality. And what they're getting in exchange for that rougher quality is the fact that it's scarce. They can only listen live. But secondly, it's interactive, where you are actually interacting with all of your fans at the same time. And that makes it fun and real and kind of edgy and raw and all the like modern stuff that people like to see. Yeah, it's that authenticity that people really want. So to go back to it real quick, and we've talked about this on other podcasts, but book trailers, we are not a big fan of book trailers for a number of reasons. But one of them is you're just not going to compete with a movie trailer. You don't have that skill set. Uh, very few of us do. And so Thomas is right. We're not talking about a produced video as much as we are seeing interaction with you on a very authentic level. Uh, and what's interesting about this, Thomas, is uh, you and I both consult one on one with authors and a number of times, I mean, more than, you know, probably 15, 20 times I've been consulting with an author and it'll come out that they have a background in theater. They have, actually have a background in performance it's like, what are you doing any kind of videos? Well, no, not really. And here's somebody that is comfortable in front of a camera. In other words, some of you are going, I am an introvert. I just cannot do this in any way, shape or form. OK, that's OK. But there are a lot of you out there that have done a little bit of drama in high school or college or involved in being in front of a camera. Why would you not explore this option? And let me tell you, you kids these days have it so easy. Back when I was a kid and on the Internet, you couldn't <laughs> just do live video with a click of a button. You had to set up a whole studio and you had to spend tons of money on a service. And then people had to download a player under their 
computers, and it was a huge hassle. Now, you kids, you don't appreciate what you have. You have Facebook Live, or you have to push a button that says Go Live, or YouTube Live. You push a button, you go live, and then suddenly thousands of people are watching you. You have no respect for what we did back in the olden days. We had to edit backwards and forwards. <laughs> we had to edit uphill, with the scissors. <laughs> the cutting room floor was for actual cutting. <laughs> it was an actual floor that things fell on when it was no longer in the film. That's Ugh. right. That's right. Um, for and, the record, it, I'm only 30 years old, but I'm like right. twice that in internet years. <laughs> that's right. And I'm only 31. And <laughs> yes, I'm selling peaches, pieces of the Brooklyn Bridge, if you believe that. Um but but here's the thing you even if even if you're saying Jim I am not comfortable in front of a camera you actually have probably probably already done this anytime you've engaged with readers in an event or a book signing or a conference you have done this and people want to see the authentic you even if it's somebody that's not that comfortable they want to see the authentic you That's right and so the key is to have fun if you're having fun yeah. while you're doing it people are going to have more fun while they're watching it and once you stop being fun stop <laughs> it's the, the nice thing about live video on facebook or youtube is that you don't have to fill a time slot uh jim and i have both done radio and you have to you know if you're doing a 30 minute radio show you got to talk for the whole 30 minutes you can't be like oh i only have 15 minutes worth of material and then i'm going to stop like with this podcast you know if i only have 15 minutes worth of stuff to say about hosting i just stop talking whereas with a radio you have to stay on so that's what you want to do with these live videos just go as long as you can be interesting all right, Tom. So how does somebody get started with something like this? They're saying, all right, you've convinced me. I'm going to give it a shot to, to do a little bit of video. How do I get started? I'd actually get started doing Google Hangouts and Skyping with friends just to get comfortable with the idea of video chatting. And you may be, have already done this. I wouldn't have your first time to be doing video on the Internet with a live audience of strangers because sometimes there's some bugs to work out in terms of getting the audio to work and the camera to work. Uh, although if you're on an iPhone, it really can be just as easy as pushing record because all of it just works yeah. automatically. And if you're on a laptop, often the camera's already there and it's already configured. Um, but I would do it a couple times on Google Hangouts, and then I would start to just experiment with it. Play it, play with it at different times of the day with different audiences. Don't spend a lot of time or money promoting it because you're not wanting it to be big at first. You're wanting to build your skills and your confidence because you'll be more fun to watch the more confident you are as you do the video. Let's talk real briefly. If you are a speaker or want to get into the speaking realm, you don't have to buy a high, high end camera. Again, if you have a smartphone, there are ways to record that. And especially if you have a friend that has a little bit of background in filming, a, a, a recent iPhone can do a tremendous job. Now, the issue always becomes, well, yeah, but you're hearing it through the PA system and it doesn't sound great and all that kind of thing, there are remote mics you can buy that work with your iPhone. So you can get a decent audio quality as well as the video for not that much money. Yeah, 50 bucks often can get you a pretty decent uh, microphone. Just go on Amazon, see which one has the highest reviews. Uh, there's quite a few options out there. And the new, if you get the new little wireless earbuds, those have a, a microphone built in. So if you just tilt your head away from the camera, so you're shooting Let's say you're shooting your left eye and you have the little earbud in your uh, right ear. People won't see it and it's going to capture that audio from right off of your face and give you a really clean audio uh, with what already comes with your phone. And, and now let's talk just real briefly about editing. So you've done this talk up front and you've gotten a decent recording of it. How do you edit it? Because you're not going to put up your whole 20 minute talk. How do you edit it? Well, there are a lot of different apps. For example, for, for PC users, Microsoft Movie Maker isn't a great uh, editor, but it does the job, you know, when you're first starting out. So we're trying to give you options that aren't going to cost you a lot of money. Thomas, what about, uh, what about Mac? Uh, Macs have iMovie, which is really great. I really like iMovie, although I've switched, I have personally switched to Camtasia, which is a paid service, and it's great for creating um, screen captures. Uh, so a lot of what I do is I'll you know shoot a tutorial video on how to use a plugin or something like that, or I'll be presenting um, a presentation that I do uh, to, to audiences where I have slides and I want to capture the slides in real time. I use Camtasia, but uh, iMovie is free. It comes with your computer, but there's a whole other option, and that is to do zero editing and don't post it where the only way to watch it is to watch it live. <laughs> what this does is it creates a sense of scarcity. I started doing this with some of my talks. They're just not available online. If you want to hear the talk, you have to come hear me live. 
And I found that it makes those live events a little bit more valuable that people come to. Because it's very tempting to just download everything and kind of live alone like a monk in your house, not interacting and getting, you know, interaction with other people. It's like, yeah, come to the live event. <laughs> it, it's it's fun. We have cake. <laughs> <laughs> and party hats. I yeah. love those party hats you did last time. <laughs> All right. So let's talk real briefly about subject matter. So we've convinced you, you should maybe give this a shot, start working on it. What should you talk about? There's a number of different things you can talk about. But if your books have themes that resonate with people, let's call them deep themes, talk about the themes in your book, because those are probably going to be universal things that apply to everybody and everybody feels that way. Another thing you could talk about is cool trivia from your novels that kind of the behind the scenes, kind of the what we would call the DVD extras um, that we talk a lot about. You could talk about trivia. What else, Thomas? Um, you can talk about, uh, you can answer character questions. You can also make it kind of a party where it's a mix of these things. I see this often for a launch where they'll have a Facebook party and they give away a book every few minutes and they're doing trivia and they kind of have different games and ways of making it interesting. You can also do kind of behind the scenes, DVD extras. It, a lot of this stuff gets easier on your subsequent books, on your first book. If it's not out yet, th this isn't really a technique for you. Uh, you, maybe you could talk about the book, but, I find that authors are far more interested in themselves talking about their book than anyone else is interested in the author talking about the book. Um, in, in, unless you really know how to pitch your book and make it sound interesting. Um, but it's the, what you want to do is you want to make it as interactive as possible. And so I would go to your launch team and say, hey, come up with some questions to ask. And don't have them give you the questions ahead of time. Uh, you want it to feel off the cuff. And then you're answering those questions. And once you get a few questions and comments, you'll get more questions and comments. It's like with us, with this podcast, uh, the first you know, a couple dozen episodes, we had to come up with all the topics ourselves. And then you, our listeners, started sending us questions. And that's where most of our topics come from nowadays is, f is your, you give us the material to podcast about. So once you all stop sending in questions, we'll stop having episodes. No, we, we come up with some of our own. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, do, it, it makes it a lot easier for us to do episodes more frequently when you're giving us great uh, material to talk about. One of the things you can do if it's not Periscope or Facebook Live or this kind of thing, but it's actually in a video that you want to to have to edit this video, a cool idea would be to take it to your next conference or take it to your next event and don't make it about you. Again, get video, get interviews with your readers, get them talking, right? They become the star. They're going to tell other people about it. They're going to come up and say, oh my gosh, you got to go see me on this this author's website. It was so fun doing an interview with them. Again, not you being interviewed, but you interview your readers. And oftentimes you can edit that into a really fun compilation. It can be a challenge to get good video from a um, event, especially an event at a hotel. Hotel lighting is like famously awful for video because the lighting all comes from above and it puts these dark shadows all over everyone's eye, uh, faces that just makes them look old and tired. Uh, so a couple of quick video tips if you want to look young and fresh on video. Uh, wear makeup. Uh, if you normally wear makeup, um, even if you're a guy, that makeup can work if you are also using the next tip, which is light. You want the light behind the camera shining on your face for s simple one-point lighting. Uh, more advanced lighting, you have uh, a main light hitting you from one angle. You have a fill light hitting you from the other side, and then you have a hair light that kind of lets people see the top of your head. That's kind of advanced stuff. But the b most basic stuff, if, if you're at a hotel and there's a window on one side of the room and then there's you know doors on the other side and all the lights coming in from the window you want to be facing the window you don't want your back to the window and just a minor change like that will dramatically increase the visual quality of your video and then for sound two really simple tips get as far away from the noise and keep the microphone as close to your mouth as possible so the classic mistake is you have somebody holding the camera who's far away from the speaker and they're in a, a, a noisy room. That's going to give you bad sound. If you're in a quiet room and the microphone's close to the speaker, you're going to have good sound. Like right now, friend, was... real quick on this. Right now, my family is in the other room watching football. And you probably can't hear them because I'm talking right Touchdown. into the microphone. <laughs> and so the microphone doesn't have to be very loud to capture my sound, which means that all of their cheering for the football game is is getting lost. And then, you know, maybe I'm wrong because this microphone's very powerful. But uh, it, that's a way to help increase the quality of the audio. And back to the lighting thing, Thomas touched on this. If you're in a hotel, well, you've got natural light coming in from the outside. Great. Well, go outside. A lot of times natural lighting. And you have to be careful here, too. You can get harsh overhead lighting. But if you 
investigate a little bit about lighting outdoors. Like photographers know the best time to take a photo is either early in the morning when the sun's coming up or, you know, when it's just before it's going down because of the colors and the way light works. So easily you can Google that on what are the best times to shoot outdoors with natural light. But if you do that, then you don't have to get into a lot of the lighting packages and some of the things Thomas was talking about. I did a video for my my latest book just came out, The Long Journey to Jake Palmer. And I did a very fun video with that. I was able to go to the location to this lake, this little lake where the book is actually set. And I had my wife film me just with my iPhone and film me in this kayak because uh, kayak uh, kayaks play into the into the book and I'm talking about the actual location it's right in the background and that was really powerful because I took my readers to the actual site where it was happening and I didn't have to worry about a lot of lighting issues because it was outdoor at the right time of the day so Jim how long would you recommend a video like that be short <laughs> short short <laughs> short uh, and and here's what I it, it, we've all heard the cliche and it's a cliche because it's true all our lives leave the audience wanting more so that's what you want to do with your videos. I would rather have a 40-second really powerful video where they go, oh, that wasn't enough, than go on, okay, I got it. We're, we're pushing three minutes here. And, well, what will happen most times is you won't be pushing three minutes because at two minutes they'll be gone. So I would say the shorter the better. Think blog posts. The most effective blog posts, sometimes they can be really effective if they're in-depth on a subject. But for the most part, I recommend shorter blog posts. Same thing with video. And the principle here is when in doubt, cut it out. And this is particularly true for a video. For a blog post, someone can still scroll down past the boring stuff and buy your book at the end. They're less likely to do it, but they might do it. Whereas with a video, if they stop watching two minutes into your three-minute video and you don't tell them the name of the book and where to buy it until the very end, you now you can't convert that viewer into a buyer and reader of your book unless they finish the video, which means the 90% of people who don't finish never find out about where to buy your book and they'll be less likely to buy your book. That's bad, right? Well, we do want to help people come become best-selling authors on That's this right. podcast, which means you have to actually sell books. You can't just give them away for free. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thomas, before we close, just let's talk a little bit about music should we have music shouldn't we have music should we have graphics no graphics i'm talking about videos that we put a little bit of time into editing ourselves should we set up a youtube channel or should we just throw these things up talk to us a little bit about that music can work if you use good music uh, you have to be careful though not to get into legal troubles so typically music you're going to have to pay for on a site like pond five there's a lot of audio clips uh, websites where you can buy two or three minutes of a song or five minutes of a song that was created specifically for videos and going in the background. And you can actually do a search for the mood. So if you want a romantic or dramatic or exciting or technological, you can find really good songs. And the going rate's between 15 and $30 for a song. Sometimes you can get them as cheap as $10 uh, for a song. So adding music is going to add some cost. I wouldn't recommend going with the free music that comes with um, you know, iMovie or that comes with uh, Windows Movie Maker if it has any free music and the only reason for that is that everyone has heard those songs a million times <laughs> and so it will make it seem very homemade and cheap yeah and it, there are sites you can go to where you can get really decent music for free but that is uh, I've done it so I can tell you that that's a painstaking process to do it it's uh, weeding through a lot of hay to find the one Correct. needle that you're looking for and one of the things I've noticed is that authors don't value their time very much when they're basically compensating themselves for their effort. They're only paying themselves 50 cents an hour, a dollar an hour, and they will rather do work for an hour than save five dollars often. Um, and so if it takes you two hours to find the right song for free, you know, and you could have bought the song for 20 bucks, you're only paying yourself ten dollars an hour, you know, and you can get better at that at McDonald's often. Um, and it's less than what minimum wage is in some states. So value your time, pay for professionals. This is kind of a theme of this um, podcast a little bit, but it's it's one of the kind of my pet peeves with authors is that they don't respect themselves enough to pay for professionals around them. They want to do everything themselves because they, they kind of insist on being very poor. And if you if you want to do this well, get a job, make some money, and then invest in your craft. Invest in surrounding yourselves with professional editors and professional cover designers and you know buy professional music. You can actually buy um, 
what's called B-roll, which is footage that you can insert. It's kind of like a stock photo, but it's a video that you can insert into your talk. So you're talking for two minutes. One way you can make it interesting is you splice it up with B-roll. So it's still your voice, but now instead of seeing you or talking head for two minutes, which can be boring, it's cutting in with clips of a soaring eagle, if you're talking about eagles or whatever. Uh, you'd be surprised how much of off TV shows that you watch is B-roll. So like when an airplane lands, you know, so the characters fly from one city to another and you see an airplane landing in an airport, the crew that made that TV show didn't film that airplane landing. They bought B-roll off of one of these B-roll sites of an airplane landing and they spliced it into their TV show to show you they've now landed in Tokyo or whatever. And you can imagine the price on that footage is dropping because now instead of needing a helicopter to go get that footage, you can do it with a drone, right? right. So, so their cost is dropping and so our cost is dropping as well. That's right. Um, another thing to consider is using graphics, uh, whether or not to use graphics. Um, graphics can work. One way to make graphics interesting is to use what's called the Ken Burns effect, which is where you're, the camera – and the camera here is in quotes because it's all on your computer. But the camera is panning across the picture. So it looks, it gives it a sense of motion. Or it's zooming in or zooming out of the picture. It's named after the famous documentary filmmaker Ken Burns, who would do these documentaries about the Civil War. And you felt like you were watching video footage because instead of showing you the whole picture of the battlefield, it would start in one part of the battlefield. And as the picture moved across the screen you saw more parts of the battlefield and the picture itself told a story and it felt like a video from a still photo and uh, it really made it very effective he was the guy he did one on baseball too if i'm thinking of the right guy didn't he he's done a whole bunch my favorite is the one on the shakers it's one of his lesser known uh, mm. documentaries but it's this interesting sect a uh, religious sect in the united states where they didn't believe in having children <laughs> uh, or getting married or having sex and they lasted for like a hundred years like, wow, some <laughs> they had some old timers then. <laughs> well, no, they they so what, what well, they I learned recruited, in the they recruited new people. They, they for for like eighty years in the United States, they took care of all of the orphans in the country. Uh, since wow. they couldn't have their own children, they had to basically get children from dead people. <laughs> that sounds really terrible the way I said it. Anyway, let's move on to the next thing. That's totally off topic. So back no, to yeah. video tips. <clears throat> the, the final thing we would suggest is well, let me say actually say one more thing, and that is. Uh, get a critique partner, like Thomas said, practice on, on Google Hangouts or that kind of thing. Then get a critique partner, just like you have for your manuscripts. And before you start putting these things up, get your friend to say, this is working, this isn't working. Remember, we're often too close to it to see it for ourselves. So get somebody that wants to do this and then just be brutally honest with each other. That's how you learn to do it well. We can talk more about video in future episodes. If you want to hear more, just let us know. This has been kind of an introductory episode. Uh, there's a whole topic about how to make videos visually interesting, which is not something that authors learn as a part of being an author. Uh, you don't have to learn how to make something visually interesting in the various visual techniques of setting up a scene and framing and rule of thirds and all of that. Um, but it all can help. But just realize it needs to be visually interesting. So attractive people have an advantage over unattractive people. Uh, it's one of the reasons why in America we value physical attractiveness so much. You're less likely to be convicted of a crime. You get paid more. The physical attractiveness is really key because we're so used to seeing on the screen where that is how someone is measured. In the movies that you watch, typically the good guys are the more attractive people and the bad guys are the less attractive people. And the bad guys are also often the wealthier business people. So if you have an ugly businessman, he's always going to be the bad guy. <laughs> you never have an ugly businessman as a good guy in a film. Ever, ever. It just never happens. Oh, now we'll get a listener to say, I saw this one obscure indie film and <laughs> yep. it never went anywhere, but it, the uh, the bad it, guy was. <laughs> well, no, the one obscure film is It's a Wonderful Life, where the hero of the story is a banker. Like, that's the only movie. It's not the only movie. It's, like, <laughs> almost the only movie. Although the bad guy of the story is also a banker. They're, like, rival bankers in the yes. town. <laughs> so. And George Bailey is the, the down and out, barely hanging on by oh, his right. fingernails yeah. banker. Which banker so. is the bad banker the rich banker? Which banker <laughs> the is the rich good banker, banker the poor banker? <laughs> so that's right. The rule still holds. Oh, man, we've totally gone off the rails this episode. <laughs> we have. I think we should talk about now the sponsor of today's episode, which is my book, Progress, which comes perfect timing because NaNoWriMo is coming up. And this free WordPress plugin, free, did I say free? I did say free, will let you track your progress and really motivate you to get to that 50,000 word limit if you're doing NaNoWriMo. Even if you're not, it's a great tool to let your readers know where your book is at. So when they come to their, your website, they'll know, oh, he's going to have a book coming out in March. He's got 30,000 words done. She's just about done with this section. 
great tool, free. You can go to mybookprogress.com and find out all the info on it. The next episode is our Q&A extravaganza. So if you have questions, now yes. is the time to send them in. We've already gotten a bunch of great questions, but we have a room for a few more. Uh, and uh, typically how we do it is that um, the quick questions that aren't we, can't, we don't have a whole episode's worth of answer, we'll just do in one big long Q&A extravaganza. And then some of the questions that come in, you may get your own episode. And there are rumors that someone has asked a five-episode question that we may be getting to soon. So do send your questions. Go to novelmarketing.com, click the Ask a Question button, and let us know what you're thinking. What do you want to hear us talk more about? You've been listening to James L. Rubart and Thomas Umstead Jr. on the Novel Marketing Podcast giving you novel ideas on how to promote yourself and your writing offline, online, and everywhere in between. Thanks for listening.